And you know what? That thought came to my head. But then again, we got to do it for Christ. Amen. And God will draw the people. And he did. So so thank you for your prayers. We had a blast. We love doing this kind of stuff. We love digging in like that. We, we actually got um, Narcan. You guys ever heard of Narcan? We got a little lesson on Narcan. We got our, our we got our packet so we can carry it with us if we see somebody. You know, he said nine out of ten people uh, are most likely overdosing rather than, you know, needing CPR right now. It used to be CPR. Give them CPR. He said, no, give them Narcan first. And then CPR if Narcan didn't wake him up. So pray for that. We, we got a big minister here. He, he was looking for the homeless camps around here so he could reach the homeless. Uh, he's from Lakeland or West Palm or somewhere like that. But we can do it here. We live here. We can reach them. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for letting us give us testimony. Uh, just a blessing. Sometimes it makes me cry because there's so many people hurting out there. We got to reach them. Amen. And we, have, we don't have much time. Thank Amen. you. All right, in your hymn books, number 63, hymn number 63, what a day that will be. Let's stand as we sing both verses of this. <laughs> Thank you. 
the darkness at dawn and he told me just what I must do I'll just lay it down and leave it I'll lay it down and leave it I'll carry this burden no dismiss our children to Children's Church at this time. I wanted to remind you, we did get our Baptist breads in. We have those for September and October, and I am a little bit behind. I'm a month behind on our newsletter, so if you're following through live stream and you've not got your newsletter yet, I apologize. I'll do best to get that out. We also have a copy of Days of Praise. These are two different ones put out by two different organizations. Uh, Days of Praise is put out by Institute for Creation Research. Um, this one, uh, Baptist Bread, um, is put out by Baptist Bread. <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead and take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah this morning. All right. Isaiah chapter 6. I've preached this passage before here at Independence, so if... If you do remember, you may. Um, but I was thinking about just what was going on in our world and some different burdens of my heart, and I, I believe this is the direction the Lord would have me go this morning. This evening I have a couple letters I'd like to read. Uh, thank you letters from missionaries and things, so looking forward to coming back tonight. Isaiah chapter 6, it's interesting because there's a cross-reference and in, out of the book of Proverbs that I, I thought of when I was thinking of this, and Proverbs 29 says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Uh, that's referring to the vision that a prophet would receive. It's not talking about somebody with 
uh, motivation in their life necessarily. What it's talking about is the prophet would receive a vision from the Lord, the Word of God. And when there is no Word of God, when there is no direction from God, revelation from God, people wander, they perish. But he that keepeth the law, it's paralleled there, the vision is the law, it's the Word of God, happy is he. Well, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, he receives a vision. Um, in fact, if you look at verse 1, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died. That's not a good thing. If you were to look at Second Chronicles, you'd learn that about King Uzziah, under his rule, God, God used him to defeat the Philistines. They had victory. That's a good thing. Under his rule, Judah, the southern kingdom, rose in power. They rose in wealth, economy. That's a good thing, right? You'd say, good, they were doing great. But you know what? Under the same rule, they deteriorated spiritually, led them to national pride. And uh, Uzziah going to the prideful act of going into the temple to offer the sacrifice in place of the priest. And what does the Word of God say? It says, God resisteth the proud. In fact, that word resist is like the military resistance. It doesn't just mean He tells them no and stiff arms them. It's talking about <clears throat> making battle against. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know why? Because pridefulness invites the judgment and opposition of God. Brother Paul, could you please empty this and get water in it, please? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. The nation puffed up with pride was judged by God, and that's where we find Isaiah. <coughs> My throat's dry, I'm sorry. In Isaiah chapter 6, God catches this vision, a revelation of God, and what it does, it changes his understanding, it broadens his theology, it convicts his heart, and it calls him to serve God with renewed passion. And, and I think really this is kind of where we're at as a nation and as a church today. God wants us to understand something, that a right view of God will give us a clear perspective of self, of sin, and of circumstances. People say, you know, you need to, you know, you need to learn yourself. Well, friend, before you learn yourself, I think we need to have a good view of God, and that'll teach us who we are, because we're made in God's image. It really puts us into perspective, and then we realize we're not God, and we understand our place a renewed understanding of our place and our purpose in this changing world. Do you understand that God has a purpose for you in this world? Things are changing on a daily basis. Who here would agree that this world and our country is much different than it was two years ago? Oh my goodness, so, so much is changing, a whirlwind. Stick around, this will change too. Who knows what's coming next? I don't, God does. And so, in the midst of what's going on in our nation, I believe there's a direct parallel here. And I want to take a look for a few minutes at Isaiah's transforming vision this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, please help us today. I pray that you would remove distractions, help us as we focus on your word, speak to our hearts, help us to see the parallel, and then apply this to our hearts, dear Lord. Help us to recognize your position, your power, dear Lord, that you are on the throne who we are, where we fit into your plan, and dear Lord, that you still have work for us to do. In your name I pray, amen. amen. I want you to notice, first of all, in verses 1 through 4, Isaiah receives a revelation. Now, that word revelation, that is the title of the last book of the Bible, but the word revelation simply means to reveal. In fact, the full title of the last book of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is being revealed in a way that we had not seen in previous dispensations. We'd seen Him as Jehovah in the Old Testament. We've seen Him as, as the, the Son of Man in human flesh in the New Testament. Guess what? In the book of Revelation, He's the God and judge on the throne. So it's a revelation of His character. Isaiah here receives a revelation of God, a view of God, a proper view of Him, and it changes him. Notice God's position. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also, so these other things were happening, not a good thing. You know, the, the nation had risen up, things were going well, but then the king died. That's a change in administration. That's not a good thing when they die. 
They didn't just vote in a new one. Usually, you were up to whoever was, you know, taking the throne. It was a cutthroat business back then. But he noticed and he saw this. I saw also the Lord seated upon His throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the doors moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah notices the position of God. He's in a position of authority. He says, in the year that the king died, the nation was in upheaval, things are uncertain. Where was the Lord? He was on His throne. The throne communicates His authority, His his sovereignty. Where Where was God when their nation lost its leadership? Where was He, church? On the throne. God did not, they didn't slip past him. It wasn't as if God was napping and something happened. It's out of God's control. He's on the throne. And sometimes we are tempted to ask or wonder when tragedy strikes or unexpected circumstances threaten our hope for what we had planned in the future, where's God? God, what, what, are, what are you doing? Guess what? He's still on the throne. Today, He's still on the throne. And it's a place of exaltation. Listen, He is still in control. This did not take Him by surprise. And and our plans may be frustrated. My plans get frustrated a lot, all right? I try not to be frustrated by that, and you should too. But He is not frustrated. He's above it all. His plans will come to pass. I love what King Nebuchadnezzar, the man puffed up with pride, what he said at the end of his seven-year period of... Um, being out of his mind. And he says this, at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven. Hadn't done that for seven years. And mine understanding returned unto me. You know what the first thing he did? I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. They used to say, O King, live forever, as if kings really do. But it was just to say, I wish that you would. You're such a good king. It was a way of giving the king accolades and wishing him well. Guess what? God does live forever. No human king does. Good kings, they don't live forever, and people cry. Bad kings, they don't live forever either but God does. Whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and He doeth according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Is God on the throne today, church? He's on the throne, high and lifted up. And it's a place of exaltation. He is above His creation. We must remember this when, when things happen that blow our mind and we say, this is chaos. And the Word of God reminds us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is on on His throne. He is in control. And it's a place of holiness. He is separate from all evil in a place of absolute power. What do they say about power? Power corrupts, but not when it comes to God. Aren't you grateful for that? We worship the King of the universe who created us with the words of His mouth, holds all in existence, and you can always trust Him to do right. And it was a personal presence. It says His train filled the temple. That's a physical place where Isaiah could see. Do you realize that even though God is on His throne, He is in control, that He is holy and above creation, not part of His creation, He's above it, that He is very imminent and intimately involved in every aspect of what's taking place? Do you understand that? We need to remember that today. His train filled the temple. Isaiah was permitted to see what our physical eyes cannot see, and that is that our God is in this place today. I don't know if that really soaks in. Our God is in this place today. Where two or three are gathered, there am I 
in their midst. Well, there's more than that here today. Praise God. By the way, if, if two or three are not gathered, God's still with you. Jesus said I, He was talking about His endorsement on the local church. And so, He is intimately involved. Psalm 46 says, Our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Matthew 18 says that if two or three shall agree on earth touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And so Isaiah is reminded of the position of God. God's position has not changed. I am the Lord, I change not. This world is changing. These times are changing. Your life is changing. Things are uncertain. Is God uncertain? No. No. Remember that, Christian. Now, notice what Isaiah sees about his worshipers, the appropriate worship of God. Angels are created by God, and they do His bidding. So when angels act on behalf of God, understand they're doing exactly what they were programmed to do. And notice what these worshipers do. God's glory demands humble worship. Verse 2, it says, above it, where God was, stood the seraphims. These are angels of fire, and they had six wings. Wings, uh, normally we think of angels with two wings, all right? Those artist renditions, all right? The Bible talks about angels and uses all different terms. These angels had six wings. Wings communicate swiftness, and they were swift to do the will, will of God. With two, they covered his face, not worthy to look upon the glory of God. With two, he covered his feet, utter humility. And with twain, he did fly swift to do the will of God. And notice what God has them doing continually. They speak of his holiness. God's glory speaks of his holiness. Look at verse 3. One cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Based upon what? The whole earth is full of His glory. In in Scripture, repetition is used for emphasis. And if there's something that they're going to emphasize about God, you you know what characteristic they're going to emphasize about Him? We would emphasize a lot of things about God. I'm thankful that God's forgiving. I'm thankful that God answers prayer. I'm thankful that God is loving and gracious, and they emphasize His holiness. And I think sometimes you and I forget how important it is that we serve a holy God. All the gods of the earth that people worship and cook up and imagine and concoct, do you realize that they are not holy? And so as good as they may be, they could change and not be good the next day. They could do evil. Allah, the God of Islam, false God, He's not holy. He's capricious. You could live your whole life serving Him, and if Allah wills it, you'll die and go to hell. They believe that. And so whenever the most common phrase that Muslims say, when anything happens, is glory to God. Do you know why they say that? Because they have to fall on a whim of a changing God that they really can't count on, and so glory to God. Something bad, glory to God. Something good, glory to God. But they say it because they really don't know what Allah wills. Our God is not like that. He does not change, and He is holy. And his worshipers emphasize that. They say the whole earth is full of his glory. Those who are in full view of God can see his glory everywhere. The angels who saw and proclaimed, they see God's glory everywhere. And I think it's important you and I recognize that those who see God for who He is will see His glory in His creation. The psalmist says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. When you look at the creation of God, even this fallen creation touched by sin, it it reflects the glory of God. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You know, when you're talking to people about the Creator, you're surrounded by an awesome illustration. Use it sometime, all right? This did not evolve by accident. This was created, and so are you. His worshipers emphasize that, and His his position has not changed. Notice His place of worship, verse 4. Isaiah is taking all this in, that the earth is full of His glory even in bad times, that the worshipers aren't focusing on these bad things. The worshipers are focusing on the glory and holiness of God, that God is still on the throne. Verse 4, the posts of the doors in the temple moved with the voice of Him that cried. You know, it's God's will that God's people praise Him with all of their heart. 
Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All right? When you come into church and you praise God, you should do it with your heart. Well, pastor, I can't sing very well. By whose standards? Who told you that? Each one of you has a musical instrument, and if you're croaking or if, you're, if you have a well-tuned instrument, if it's coming from the heart, can you make the doors shake? Well, if you croak loud enough. <laughs> and if it comes from the heart, guess what? God receives it as worship and praise. Yes, amen. You're not singing to men or for yourself. These man-made ways and metrics of saying it. Who cares whether my ears like it or not? By the way, when you get to heaven one day, it'll be beautiful. You'll sing with the voice of an angel. The posts of the doors, this was the forcefulness of their worship. With all their heart, they poured out. And God's will is that His worshipers would praise Him with such force that the walls tremble and shake. If there's something worthy to put your heart into, it's serving God and praising God. So when you praise God, do it with all the praise that you might give your football team. You get excited when your football team scores a goal and you stand and shout, but you won't praise God with a shout? Something's wrong. All right? We praise men. Let's praise God. And if you don't watch football, whatever you praise, I don't know. Okay, I don't watch football, but I know a lot of people do. His whole, the house was full of the smoke, and through, throughout the Word of God, His glory is represented by clouds And there it was. This is what Isaiah saw. He received a revelation that God is on the throne. God's position has never changed. Sadly, sometimes we forget that, and our view of the world possesses our mind more than the view of God, and it affects our worship, Christian. But the Bible still says, It says, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name, for the Lord is good. Is the Lord still good? The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Is that still true, church? Yes. Yes. He's the ultimate authority, far above all others, separate from all sin, and it demands my holiness and praise. And so Isaiah sees this, he internalizes it, and he can't help but respond. Notice what he does in verses 5 through 7. He gets a view of God, and it gives him a view of self. God is everything good that I am not. People who think that they are God or worship themselves, the self-esteem crowd, they really don't have an accurate view of God because God is so good, and he says, I am not. He sees his guilt of sin. Look at verse 5. Then said I, woe is me. I'm undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now, notice the order there. He doesn't say, wow, God's such a great God. Man, this is a wicked world. You need to do something about it. He says, I'm unclean, unclean. I have unclean lips. You know what Jesus said? He said, that which proceedeth forth out of the mouth cometh forth from the heart. Our mouth is a litmus test for the heart. He says, I have lips that need to be cleaned. You know what he was doing right there? He's confessing, quite literally. The word confess means to agree with or to say the same thing as, and he is agreeing with God's estimation of his sin. He's confessing. What does the Bible say about confession? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Woe unto me. I am a man of unclean lips. I have lied. I have said things that are unkind. I have let bitterness and gossip come out of my mouth. I have had profanity and possibly used the name of the Lord in vain. Woe is me. And I dwell in the midst of a people who does it. And I realize that. Why? Because mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He responds by confessing his sin, recognizing the reality of sin, not minimizing it. And notice what God does in verse 6. He receives cleansing from sin. He's purified by sacrifice. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. Which altar was this? was the altar of incense where the sin offering would be burned. Thus, it means that the sin offering had been burned. If there was a coal there... Where there's a coal, there's fire, right? So the the sin offering had been burned, it had been taken care of, and therefore it was applied to his lips. That's the picture here. 
and it was sufficient for the purity of the sin, to purify the sin of the prophet. He had a live coal in his hand from which he had taken with tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth so that sin offering was applied to Isaiah's mouth and his heart. Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Now, this is very important because I want you to understand the order in which this passage is taking place. Isaiah sees God, accurate view of God. He recognizes his sin, accurate view of sin and self. He's cleansed from sin, and then you know what he does? He receives a calling to serve God. See, Isaiah would receive the call to represent God to mankind. Isaiah was a prophet. This was his function, to represent God to the people. But before our mouth can speak truthfully and carry the pure message of God endorsed by Him, guess what? Our mouth needs to be cleansed. We need cleansing of sin. James chapter 3 puts it this way. It says, "...therewith with our mouth we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings." My friend, these things ought not so to be. Before we can properly serve the God who desires to call us to represent Him in this world, we need to be purified from our sin. And it's possible. God welcomes us. He'll give that to us in order to praise Him as He deserves, to speak of His holiness as He deserves. Our sin needs to be removed from our mouth. We need to recognize it. Isaiah does that, and he receives a calling. His eyes are opened. Look at verse 8. This is the order, a view of God, a view of self and sin, confession and forgiveness, and then he receives his calling. Verse 8, also, I heard the voice of the Lord. Now, I love what's happening here because the Lord really hasn't spoken to Isaiah yet. He's just observing these things like a third-party observer. In fact, in verse 8, God doesn't really speak to Isaiah. He's communicating with the angels and within Himself. Our God is a trinity, right? And so He's one God, three persons. God does speak within the Godhead. So He heard the voice of the Lord saying, this is like a rhetorical question, Isaiah hears it, but God's not speaking to him. Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Do you know that you don't necessarily have to receive a commission from God in order to say, God, I want to be used by you? Some people say, well, I want God to touch me and tell me what He wants me to do. Why not volunteer? Does the world need to be reached? Have you received a vision of God? Has your mouth... Yeah, you have. It's right here, okay? We, We see it on a daily basis. Yes. Not with your physical eyes, but we know who He is. We can look in Scripture and and have a clear view of who He is. Have you received confession and and forgiveness of sins? Then why not volunteer? Who will go for us? But but it's a time of national tragedy and things are happening and, and times are changing. And you know what God says? Go. Then Isaiah said, here am I. Like, like butting in, I mean... He's in the presence of the king. Normally, you don't interrupt a king if you want to keep your head, right? But this is the king of the universe, and so if respect is deserved, and I I just wonder how Isaiah said this, um, God, it's me over here. I'll go. Send me. You know, that's really the attitude that we should have. He's impressed by God's holiness. He humbles himself and confesses, and he's swift to do the will of God. He has no wings, so he'll serve God in whatever capacity God calls him to. The upward look, the inward look, and the outward look, right? That's, what, that's that song we sing. This is where it comes from. This world is in need. They need God. I have His message. God, I'll go. Do you want me to? And you know what God, God says? God says, no, you're not qualified. You need to go to seminary, and um, you don't know enough. You need to go through soul winning classes, and you're not, you know, there's there's a lot of work that really, leave it to the professionals and the pastors. God didn't say that. He says, okay, do you realize that most of these prophets were just normal, everyday guys? A couple of them, in the the, the prophets, one one of them, he he was a gardener. And he would, he would cut figs. That's what he did every day for a living. You want to talk about a mindless task? He would cut figs and, and take the, 
the, uh, the seed out of the figs. And God says, hey, I want you to go and take my message. Really? And then he went and took the message. And then when he's done, he went back to his work. Just a normal everyday guy. A lot of us here are like that. In fact, some of you are better than that, right? You have, you have, you have, you know the Lord for several years. You know his word. And God says, go and tell this people. Go ahead, Isaiah, you go. Start with the people around you. You know, it's interesting. uh, We have this idea of missions, and we should, that missions is far and wide, crossing cultural boundaries with the message of Jesus Christ to plant local churches beyond the border of this local church. Now, that's a long 50-cent definition, okay? That's most of the time what we think of, church planting in other nations where I can't go. Missions is just the Great Commission. It's just an extension of what we should be doing here. That's why in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, "'Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you.'" By the way, Christian, if you're saved today, how many Christians have the Holy Spirit today? Let's try that again. How many Christians have the Holy Spirit today? All of them. Okay, so you have the power then, is what Jesus said. You shall receive the power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You have that. All right. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That's where they were at. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, where you don't want to go, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You start in Jerusalem, where you're at. And so he says, go and tell the people, Isaiah. You go ahead and go. The world needs you. Start here. In the midst of a national tragedy, I should be telling the gospel? Well, don't you think people need to hear the gospel these days? Oh, my goodness. Yes. It's a difficult year this year. In response to... It's, it's immoral out there, Pastor. People don't want to hear the gospel. I, I can tell when people... Brother Paul was talking about... I can tell in a heartbeat whether or not somebody's going to let me tell them about Jesus Christ. And sometimes we'll use those locked doors as an excuse why not to talk to people about Jesus Christ. But you know, I had a professor in college, he was the pastor of the church at a time, and he said, instead of walking around looking for open doors, why don't we start jiggling handles? (laughs) Now, don't do that on your door-to-door ministry. If you're going door-to-door, don't jiggle the handles on people's doors. You might get shot in Florida, okay? (laughs) But when you're talking to people, don't always just look for an open door. Try to see how open it is, or if it's locked. Build relationships. The people you come into contact with them, go and tell a little more. Sow the the Word of God. Now, the message won't be popular all the time. In fact, God tells Isaiah, He says, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and seek ye indeed, but perceive not. They're going to hear. Not all of them are going to understand it. Some of them are going to see. They're not all going to hear it. But look what he says, make the heart of this people fat. I'll be gent- gentle with the way that I'm saying this, but if you eat more calories than you burn, you tend to gain weight, right? That's referring to someone that's taking in too much, filling themselves up. God says in the same way that somebody would do that and be overweight, you need to fill them up with God's Word. Amen. Make the heart of them fat, fill it up, and their ears Heavy. What happens if you put too much in a bag? It gets heavy. Right. My son went uh, kayaking this past weekend with my wife, and they were they were they had a, a ba- he had a bag, and his bag was full of junk, like all kind of stuff. He, he had some really helpful stuff in there, but it got really heavy. <laughs> Don't you know, men, when you go on a, a trip, that your wife's bag is usually heavy. That's exactly right. <laughs> When you fill their ears full of God's Word, God is saying you should be putting it into their ears every chance that you get, speaking the truth in love, and shut their eyes. It says, make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and convert and be healed. Sometimes people don't want to hear and they just turn themselves away. They'll, They'll shut their eyes to it mentally, you know but you just keep going. So Isaiah says, okay, God, I'll go. I know not everybody's going to accept it. I know the times are not good, but the world needs it. If I'm sinful, they're sinful. I've got, I know who you are. I'll go. How long should I go, God? And he was asking the right questions. Look at verse 11. Then, I, then said I, Lord, how long? Is this like a two-year mission trip, a three-month? Um, is this like a survey trip? Um, when am I going to get some time off? Can I just do this temporarily or retire from it? 
I love what God says. He answered and said, um, you talk to people until there's no people to talk to. It's literally what he says. Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant. It, just go talk to people about me. Tell them the truth about who God is. Give them the vision of who God is until there's nobody else to talk to. Until you leave or they do. And the house is without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men from far away. You know, one day, Christian, one day you're going to run out of people to talk to about the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, Pastor? Yeah, because when you leave this world and you go to heaven, you're going to be surrounded by people who already know the gospel. You're not going to be doing door-knocking ministries in heaven, all right? It's not going to happen. You're going to be praising Jesus and walking on streets of gold and a lot of other things too. Praise God for that. One day you're not going to have any time left. But right now, guess what the mission of the church is still in these unchanging times? is to win the lost, is to disciple the saved, and is to replicate the process. And each one of us, I know it's hard right now. I know that times are different. Uh, we're not doing door-to-door. -door. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to adapt some things. I, I still want to do visitation. We still need to reach out. You're still talking with people. If you, you say, well, pastor, I don't go out shopping. I order my groceries on the internet. Well, somebody has to deliver them. Give them a tip and a track, right? By the way, tip them so that they'll take the track and they'll read it, okay? If you interact with people, servicemen, or if you go to the doctor, bless his heart, Brother Lucky Shepherd. He's with the Lord now, not just too many weeks ago. You know, I went and visited him in the hospital, and there wasn't a single technician that got into his room and left without getting a track in their hand. And I think he had already given him a track several times because the one guy, he came in and he, oh, thank you. And I think, I think he said something about receiving another one. But he, he was there. These people had to come to him. The mission field was right. There. And I love that zeal. You know, we live in a society who doesn't always want to hear the truth. Second Timothy says, says this, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing, preach the word. Well, pastor, women can't be preachers. Ah, I differ. They can't be pastors, but they can sure... Pre you know that word preach just means to proclaim? It does. Now, you might disagree with me. I love you. That's okay. The word preach means to proclaim. You can proclaim the truth with a soft voice or with a loud voice. You can proclaim the truth as a woman or as a man. This is a commandment given to a local pastor. I understand that. But ladies, you can give the truth out as well. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? When it's convenient, when it's inconvenient, with all long suffering. That means don't give up doctrine. That means truth. Well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There's a window of opportunity with each person. We don't know how long that is. And, and I'm being reminded of that more now than ever. These past few weeks, since tragedy has hurt our, hit our church, since we have lost people, I'm a pastor, I preach about these things all the time, but it has occupied my mind in such a way more now than ever, I think, in my life, of how fleeting this life is. We take it for granted. You may not be here tomorrow. That lost loved one may not be here tomorrow. Every opportunity we have, we should be seizing it. Now, during coronavirus, Amen. people might meet the Lord soon. They definitely need to know Him. The time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's called an echo chamber. It means searching for things that you agree with and make you feel good and then choosing to believe that they're true. I have a position. I believe this is true. I'll find people who feed me what I want to hear. And guess what? You can find it everywhere. Religious programming, YouTube, the information age, but also the misinformation age. And that means that we who have an accurate view of God have a, have a burden on us now more than other. As, as time is running out, as people's lives, they're being reminded that this life is short. 
They need us to remind them, to speak with love, to love them enough to tell the truth. You know what, when we proclaim His Word, now, now we look here at this last verse and I'll close. God is saying all of these things. He says it'll be desolate, there will be nobody left. We know that He's speaking, I believe He's speaking about the judgment of, of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD here prophetically. And you might say, well then, Isaiah was not successful. The nation never really repented. Let me remind you of something. God does not measure success the same way you and I do. His metric for success is faithfulness. Well done, thou good and number-producing servant, the one who had the most crowds, who, who all the... Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So can we be faithful? Yeah. You know what it's going to take, though? It's going to take you and me having a burden for the lost. It's going to take you and me renewing our mind. I quoted the Scripture verse in Sunday school, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A dead sacrifice gives everything in death. A living sacrifice gives all of its energies in life. God gave you life, live it for Him. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what that means? A daily reminder of who God is, where He's at, what His worship is, what kind of praise He deserves, that yes, we're sinners, but if we're purified and we know God, then we have a duty. Don't wait for that commission and tapping on the shoulder. I want a vision from an angel. Guess what? You've gotten better from that. God says, here's the word. Just volunteer. Are you burdened for the loss today? It's still God's will that we win souls. Are you burdened by your own sin today? When's the last time you purified your mouth so that you could carry the message of God's holy word? Have you spent time meditating on who He is? I, I, I want to challenge each of you today at some point, to spend some time meditating on your God, because I believe an accurate view of God will remind us of our place in this world and our purpose for the rest of our life. Amen. One day is going to be too late to serve Him. Right. Now is the arena of service and laying up rewards in heaven. That transforming vision changed Isaiah. Let it change us. Would you bow with me? Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word. I thank You for Your blessings today and for Your people. Help us, O God, that we would live for You, that we would not get bogged down chasing our tails, as so many in the world are, that we would keep our focus on You, our heart for You, serving You, and serving others. In Your name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed? God has spoken to your heart this morning, if there's a decision that you need to make, talk to the Lord during the invitation time. If you need to come forward and pray, the altar is open. If you need prayer, I'll pray for you. As the piano plays, talk to the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask you to look up this way, please. Um, would you guys come over this way?